Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center's virtual annual meeting. Of course, we would have preferred if we could have met in person tonight, but um, if we learned anything as a society from 2020, we learned that we need to expect the unexpected and go for it. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna go for it. And that means we're virtual. Welcome everyone. We may face a few technical challenges this evening, and if we do, I apologize in advance. Please hang in there with us. We will get them fixed, and we will get uh, back online as quickly as we can. First of all, my name is Laura Ballard, and um, it's my pleasure to be the one to be the first to welcome you to tonight's meeting. I have been involved with the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center since 1998 and that's when I first moved on island. Over those last 20 years, I've seen a lot of changes at the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center. Most recently, I was your board president, and um, we saw a lot of changes and um, a lot of tough times. But I wanna tell you one thing that's definitely certain about the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center, and that is that it just keeps getting better and better and better. Their important role in our community is something that I have always appreciated. And I say our community, and I mean our, yours and mine. Recently, I moved off island. But St. Croix and the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center are always going to have a big piece of my heart. They do now, and they always will. You obviously are listening in and tuning in tonight because you care about the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center, too. I wanna thank you for that. It sounds trite, but it's literally true. We could not do it without you. So thank you for being here tonight and thank you for all that you do for the shelter. Tonight, you're gonna to hear how your gifts and your support have helped the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center and how it will continue to help the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center. Thank you. You'll be hearing from a few different hosts tonight. The presentation starts with me, and I'll be presenting this introduction, and I'll also go over our mission statement and maybe just a tiny bit of our history. Our new board president, Jennifer Simpson, will then introduce herself. As you will see, she has a true passion for the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center and for our island community. The shelter is in great hands with her at the helm. Following Jennifer will be Dr. Michelle Mihalik, she will highlight some of the successes and the heartwarming results of our 2020 programs and efforts. You're gonna be impressed. There's some really great things that happened last year. Our new executive director, Pearl Youssef, will be the next presenter and she will give you a snapshot of our 2020-2021 financials and budget situation. She will share our vision for the future and she will also share how you can be a help in that vision and your role in it. There's a lot to cover, so let's begin. Next slide, please. The St. Croix Animal Welfare Center was founded in 1973 by a group of very caring individuals who sought to better the lives of the strain abandoned animals that they saw in the streets. I'm sure they didn't know how long their little organization was going to last. It has been serving our community for 50 years now. Think about that, 50 years. A little over 20 years ago, they adopted the following mission statement. Our mission is to provide and promote the humane treatment of animals through education, animal protection, and community service. This mission statement is as relevant today as it was 20 years ago when they first adopted it. It guides all of the animal welfare centers, programs, and operations. Tonight, you're gonna to hear about programs and services that we did last year to accomplish this mission. And yes, this job is challenging, but as you will see, the shelter team manages to overcome so much, even pandemics. We have a great dedicated staff. They are appreciated far more than they know. And I wanna shout out to them right now. Thank you guys for all that you do. I know you're listening. Next slide, please. The St. Croix Animal Welfare Center is governed by an all-volunteer board of directors. Now, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our board members 
past and present, for their hard work and their dedication. Animal welfare on St. Croix has come a long, long way because of their dedication and commitment. Their leadership has been meaningful. This is the current board that you see on the screen. There are some pretty amazing and dedicated individuals on this list. Now being a board member is a privilege, but it's also a sacrifice. And it is a lot of damn hard work. I assure you that the work has been worthy. Board member and new board president, Jennifer Simpson is our next speaker. And I just wanna say a few words. I met Jennifer for the first time in October of 2017, right after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And I knew right away that she had a great love of animals and for people, and that she was going to be a great friend of our shelter. Jennifer and her husband, Mike, have since moved here for full time. They are dedicated members of the St. Croix community, and this is their home. I'm confident in Jennifer's ability and in her passion, and it gives me great pleasure to pass the leash over into her hands. Thank you, Jennifer, for your hard work, and on behalf of this organization and the animals and people of St. Croix, thank you. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Simpson. Good night, St. Croix. My husband and I loved it here when we first visited in 1996 on our honeymoon. We came back in 2017, weeks before Hurricane Maria, and we never left. We live in downtown Frederickstead, along with our two sweet island dogs and one not so sweet island cat. My love of animals drew me to volunteer at the shelter and the shelter commitment to our community is what convinced me to join the board. I'm both humbled and honored to be at the shelter and, and serve the community I've come to love so much. I look forward to all we in the shelter can accomplish together for both the animals and humans of St. Croix. Uh, I also wanted to take a minute to thank Laura for her years of dedicated service. When she asked me if I'd be willing to step into this role, I hesitated, not because I didn't want to help, but because in the time I got to know Laura and some of the shelter staff, I knew she was a force within the shelter. Besides her years of service before 2017, Laura got the shelter up and running again after the storms destroyed everything. I knew she had very large shoes to fill. I and everyone at the shelter will never be able to properly thank her for all she did, and we remain incredibly grateful and still call her fairly often for information. Thank you, Laura, truly, for all your years of service. Before diving into the presentation, I would like to take a few moments to acknowledge some of our contributors. Never have I experienced such a dedicated staff, many of whom have been here for years through some incredibly difficult times. I'm continually impressed with their commitment every time I visit the shelter. Many of you know I'm here sometimes uh, every Wednesday to take photographs. I only wish I had or could take, take photos of all of them and put them on this presentation. Whether fostering or working in the clinic, the kennels are coming to bottle feed babies separated from their mamas. We love our volunteers. We want more volunteers. Their unwavering support remind us why we do this every day and why we do what we do. Many businesses support our shelter through donations, hosting events, offering raffle items and other in-kind contributions. They show their commitment to our community every day. Uh, I find if I wear my shirt to work, I sometimes work at Molly's part-time, people ask me about the shelter and I can't wait to tell them all about it. We're also grateful for countless individual donors. Every dollar and every item received has put to good use. We don't have nearly enough slides to put everybody in we wanna thank, but we're very happy to have you. And of course, we're grateful for foundation grants that make many of our essential programs possible. Uh, thank you to all staff, volunteers, donors, and supporting foundations for your ongoing generous contributions, support, and hard work. Moving forward, the shelter focus has expanded to support the community, helping to keep pets in their homes with their loving families, a proactive approach to sheltering instead of reacting. We've experienced tremendous growth in our programs in the past few years and demand is still growing. We're not the dog pound anymore. We're living up to our name as the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center, expanding our reach far beyond the 2,500 animals that entered the shelter in 2020. In the midst of this evolution, we have been hit by a succession of two seri or serious challenges. 
two category five hurricanes, which destroyed our home in Clifton Hill. And then of course, starting in 2020, the pandemic continues to affect us to this day. The most serious consequence is significantly reduced donations. In order to keep up this vital momentum, we need your support now more than ever. Coming up, you'll hear from Dr. Michelle about the impact and success of each of the programs. And later, our new executive director, Pearl Yusuf, will offer a financial picture. Thank you so much for joining to us tonight. Dr. Michelle? Good evening, St. Croix. I'm Dr. Michelle Mahalik. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the medical director here at the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center. Um, and this is the part of the presentation where I nerd out on some statistics uh, and make it a little more interesting by talking about the programs that drive those numbers. Next slide, please. So uh, tonight we'll be talking about all the programs you see there in relation to uh, what their impact is on life-saving here at the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center and also how we reach uh, pet owners and pets outside of what we bring into the shelter. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to, I'm going to come back to this slide towards the end, but I wanted to put it up here in the beginning just to show that animal sheltering is not a simple problem. Um, it's a very multifaceted problem. Um, we are an open admission shelter, which means we take in any animal that comes through our doors at any time. Um, that means owner surrenders or strays. Uh, Shelter intakes, we had about 2,500 intakes this year. Um, and that's a little lower than last year's numbers. And that is, in fact, due to the pandemic. So we did actually um, have to limit admissions for the first time ever in our history um, last year. So those numbers are a bit lower than before. Next slide, please. So these are the outcomes. So for all the animals that entered the shelter, they also had an outcome. Um, and the three first categories, adoptions, transfer out, and returns, um, are all what we call a live release. So all of these animals had a live outcome from the shelter. Um, that is 86% of the animals that entered. That is by far our highest life-saving rate that we've ever achieved. And um, we hope to continue on that upswing. Next slide, please. So this is just a slide to show you all where we've come from. Um, if you're a new supporter or you haven't been with us long, it was only uh, six short years ago that we were unfortunately euthanizing over 80% of the animals that entered the shelter. Um, that big blue line at the bottom that's getting smaller and smaller is our number of euthanasias by year. This is just another way of looking at this. Um, you can see the dogs on the bottom and the cats on top, um, the number of lives saved each year. Uh, you can see at the end, 2020 is a bit lower because we had a lower number of animals and that's primarily in cats. And the main reason for that is because we had a mandatory shutdown at our prime kitten season. So unfortunately, we were unable to do TNVR, one of our programs we'll talk about in a minute, uh, during that, that prime time in the season. The purple line is just our live release rate, and you can see that going up every year. Next slide, please. So when we talk about each uh, program, we're gonna talk about it in categories of life-saving. So at the bottom, the pie graph shows that each category of life-saving is about 30%, um, but it looks very different between dogs and cats. So for dogs, our transfer out program is the most impactful for life-saving. And with cats, our return and TNVR programs. Next slide, please. So when we talk about each program, we're also gonna talk about the cost of those programs because not all life-saving is the same cost, right? Um, some of them are more labor intensive, some are more expensive, um, but we're gonna talk about that when we talk about each program as well. Um, the biggest thing that drives cost is the a length of time that an animal stays in our care. So the more quickly we can move an animal through the shelter system or the less time they spend in care, um, we're, we're definitely decreasing costs. We do have a more expensive cost of care right now. Um, that's primarily due to increased uh, rents and utilities that we didn't have in our Clifton Hill facility. And also we had, um, we had some key positions that were vacant the last time we, we ran some numbers for cost of care, uh, including the executive director position, which is clearly a, a needed position. Um, I wanna point out here that uh, foster care uh, really helps us to uh, lower that cost of care. So uh, we do need your funds more than ever though. So uh, stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. 
So our first program I'm going to talk about is adoptions. And we saw a total of 673 on-island adoptions last year. That's a great number. Um, and they've already had a really strong start to 2021. Um, they've already reached uh, a third of that in the first quarter. So we're hoping that by the end of next year, or the end of this year, we'll see an even bigger number in adoptions. Next slide, please. Um, the next big uh, life-saving category is a transfer out program. So this is mostly commercial flights. Um, the shelter has always had some sort of transport program, but the cargo flights, um, which were really the baby of Sally Gear, a board member and founder of Island Dog Rescue, um, really allowed us to move a lot of animals at one time. Next slide. So um, this is an expensive program and it is a program that takes a lot of effort. Um, coordinating the flights takes a lot, um, getting that all together and it's expensive. Uh, the animals stay in our care for longer to make sure they have no medical issues that we're sending out and they're fully vetted. Um, but it's a huge payoff because again, it's our biggest life-saving category for dogs right now. And it's absolutely mandatory to save lives until we can get more local outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, I did want to point, touch on this a little bit. Sometimes I get questions or concerns about transfer program. Um, is it pushing your problem onto someone else? Is it, uh, you know, aren't you just sending your problem away? And I promise you that's not the case. All of our sister shelters who receive our pets, it's a plus and it's a win for their organization as well. It brings adopters through their doors. It helps with their local adoptions. And it's part of a nationwide effort to realize that although some areas really don't have a problem with pet overpopulation anymore, many parts of the United States do. So it's a very responsible attitude um, through shelters to make sure that we really have fixed the problem before we say, okay, we're done, you know. Next slide, please. I wanna thank our fosters um, because they are so critical, especially for our adoptions and uh, transfer programs. We have so many foster families. It is amazing. This program really didn't even exist five years ago. And now we have over 340 foster families. And it's just so amazing the work that they do. Um, we've been able to um, say that about half of the time that our animals spend is in foster care now. And that's so important for the animals. Um, but the fosters help us to help the animals to decompress. They help us to learn more about the animals. And it's just so amazing the work they do. And it's, it's really exciting to see so many people in our foster program now. Okay, so our third main category of life-saving um, is the return. And this is kind of a catch-all, but there's really four main categories in there. Um, and it's the return to owner, the return to finder, the TNVR, and surrender intervention. So you can go to the, um, well, stay on here just a second. Um, the, um, the return to owner is a legitimate return to owner. Um, historically, we've seen that number at about 1.5%, which is horribly low. But la in 2020, it was 6%, and in 2019, it was 8%, um, which is a significant increase. And that's really owners coming in and finding their lost pets. And we think that that increase is probably due to um, our, our intensive microchipping efforts that we've been doing for quite some time. Um, one of our biggest uh, uh, subcategories of the return is our TNVR program, and this is for cats. And um, if you're not familiar with this program, Trap, Neuter, Vaccinate, Return, this has been uh, monumental for saving the lives of cats on St. Croix. We have a lot of feral cats on St. Croix, and this is a humane alternative to euthanasia. Um, it is really allowed our life-saving numbers to just increase dramatically for cats. You can go ahead to the next slide. And the fourth and final uh, subcategory under this return is what we call a surrender intervention. So this is where someone comes to the shelter to surrender their pets. Um, a lot of times it's mom with puppies. Our biggest um, reason for surrender historically has been too many, um, too many pets, too many to take care of. And so through surrender intervention, we're often able to provide um, services, mainly medical, um, spay, neuter, basic wellness care, 
and have owners go back home with some of those pets or have mama spayed or have the other moms on the property spayed so that we get to the root of that too many problem. And this number is going up every year. A lot, sometimes we may spay and neuter puppies and have the owners rehome them. Um, so that that's definitely an expanding category um, that really helps our community. Go to the next one. Uh, I want to thank the intake staff. They work so hard and have one of the toughest jobs. Um, there's only one staff scheduled per day and the conversations they have to have are tough. Um, when people are coming to surrender, it's, it's not usually a fuzzy thing. Um, people are experiencing a lot of feelings, including sadness, fear, frustration. Um, and we didn't have intake counseling prior to four to five years ago. So it's a new concept for people who may not have been, um, who may not have surrendered recently. Um, I do want to say that these are, in fact, the highest category of lives saved, and it's also by far the lowest cost. So the cost of saving a life through the return program on, in, on average is about a quarter of sending them off island on a transport or through a local adoption. You can go to the next slide. So rescue, everybody knows this guy, right? This is Moises, he's like a pillar in our community. So he has been rescuing animals on St. Croix for over 20 years and he is still doing it to this day. Um, and he comes up with some very ingenious methods as you can see in the last picture with the ladder up against the tree. Um, and although we're not always able to go and pick up every stray, if there's an animal that is suffering, an animal in need, we will always go out and pick up those animals and provide a rescue. Next slide. So in the next two programs I'm going to talk about, these numbers are, we are affecting animals beyond what comes into the shelter. So I'm gonna talk about the community clinic and I'm gonna talk about our new program, Project Safe. And this has an expansion beyond just what comes into the shelter. So this. These are our really proactive uh, programs. These are what's keeping animals, hopefully, from ever having to come through our doors. And these are our more modern um, and progressive methods of sheltering. So the low cost community clinic is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it focuses on wellness care, that's vaccinations, heartworm prevention, spay neuter, things that put pets on a, on a track to, to health. Um, and it's a safety net for owners who can't afford care and may have to surrender pets because they can't access care. Um, since 2016, we've treated um, over 14,000 animals. So that's, that's really crazy. Um, and the other side of the low cost clinic though, is it allows us, it strengthens the other programs we have. So it's an expensive program, but it allows for us to have um, a lot of, of highly trained medical staff that the shelter animals can also benefit from. And it also, um, it allows us to have the diagnostic equipment as well. Um, I can't really justify buying an x-ray machine just for shelter animals, but if I can um, generate some revenue out of that machine, then, then that's a possibility. Um, this also gives an avenue for new time pet owners. We have free post adoption exams where we check in with a new adopter, make sure everything's going well and give them a plan to wellness for life for that pet. Uh, very busy, we did over 3000 surgeries in 2020 and um, the majority of those were spay and neuter. You can go to the next slide. Um, I wanna thank my clinic volunteers, especially um, these ladies are amazing. Um, they do so much work and, and help us tremendously. We just couldn't do it without them. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of quite just how busy we are, um, this, this top chart is our, our schedule for a Tuesday morning when both Dr. Camille and I are here. Um, and that's just the first three hours of the day. Um, and the slide on the bottom is our, our weekly, is the week appointments for that week. So you can go to the next slide. So um, I do know because uh, people in the community tell me all the time, yes, there is a wait to get into the clinic. I'm sorry, we're doing our best. Um, the truth is, is that we, we really have more demand than we're able to accommodate right now. And, and we're doing our best to keep up with everyone who needs the help. Um, but this is not unique to us. Um, it is more of a nationwide issue right now. Um, 
that there are more positions available for veterinarians than there are um, than there are vets <laughs> to fill them. So um, we'll continue to do the best we can without compromising patient care. I wanna thank all of the clinic staff and our front desk staff um, for the very busy work that they do every day. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is super exciting for me. We get to talk about Project SAFE. Um, the, we've never reported on this program before. Um, this came about uh, because ASPCA came here after the storms. And as many of you know who live on St. Croix, we're kind of this no man's land where we don't really count as the US or we don't count as international. So in the animal welfare center community, in the animal welfare community, what that means is a lot of times you're not eligible for grants that you would be if you lived in the mainland or if you were a truly international uh, location. So because ASPCA came here to help out after the after Maria, we were able, Laura Ballard and I were able to sit down with the head of granting um, and we said, we have all these new programs, we have all these resources available, but what happens if people never walk through the door and ask for help? How do we offer help for people that aren't going to ask? And that's how Project Safe started with that idea in mind. And luckily we were selected um, and we're so humbled by this, a very generous grant from the ASPCA to start up Project Safe. So you can go to the next slide. So what this program is, is we go door to door in a van and we offer free care. We offer free wellness care, basic wellness, vaccinations, microchipping, spay and neuter, pet supplies, humane tie outs. Um, we selected the neighborhoods for this based on um, reviewing 10 years of shelter intake data. And that is um, where we were seeing the most animals come in from. Um, it is important to realize that uh, one of the latest estimates puts 27% of St. Croix families below the poverty line, and it's almost 10% higher in children. Um, it's about 12% in the, in the continental US for comparison. And despite that, we often have lower median incomes, even though it's a more expensive place to live. So we have a lot of community members that really are struggling um, as far as income goes. You can go to the next slide. So the first thing we did when we started this program is we asked a lot of questions. So we wanted to know, what do you need help with? We didn't want to assume anything because assumptions can be really dangerous, right? We don't want to spend a bunch of money and, on things people don't need. Um, and a lot of, we, we, so we got a ton of data um, from our clients about, you know, their pets, their life style. Um, and we found some, some surprising things, something that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, I'm going to share a few of those with you right now, but sometimes we hear um, things like, oh, well, if you can't afford a pet, you shouldn't have one. It turns out only 8% of our clients actually purchased their pet. Um, the rest of them acquired them in ways like from a family or a friend, or they were stray, or their animal had puppies or kittens, and they kept them. So these are animals that would have been essentially entering the shelter system if these families hadn't given them a home. So, um, you know, even though they were struggling themselves, they opened their, their lives and their homes to an animal in need. Um, the other statistic that we have to, uh, that we have to just be blown away by, um, based on, I think, some assumptions people may have, is that almost 80% of our clients were completely agreeable to spay and neuter. They were just fine with it, no problem at all. Only 4% of our clients actually said, nope, I don't want to spay and neuter. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so we asked, okay, well, obviously, there's no hesitation to spay and neuter for most of our clients, so what are the reasons blocking that? Um, and as we can see, cost, which we would expect was the highest, but also time uh, came in second and transportation was also a very significant factor. And when I say time, I don't mean like, I just don't feel like it today. I mean, it's going to come at the expense of something else in my life. Um, you know, it's going to come at the expense of maybe taking my mother to a doctor's appointment or being able to watch my child. Um, so those are the, unfortunately, the kind of um, things that people need to choose from um, when you are struggling and 
low income. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So less than 40% of all the patients in the program um, had ever been to a vet before. 80% um, of our patients uh, were not spayed and neutered when they entered the program. You can go to the next slide. So I'm just gonna go over some, some of our major outcomes and outputs from this program. Um, in re regards to that, that first question, how do we reach people who won't ask for help or who haven't asked for help? Nearly 60% of the clients that were served through this program had never had an interaction with the Animal Welfare Center before. They'd never adopted, they'd never surrendered, they'd never brought a stray, they'd never used our clinic. So this was a great win to be able to meet so many people and, and make them aware of our services. Um, overall, we've had a spay neuter conversion rate to about 50%. We've been able to spay neuter about 50%. It's getting way better. Um, so far this year, it's almost 70%. And that's because we're getting better and knowing how we need to do this. And transportation is the key. We found that if we come pick up the animals within a few days of their initial visit, um, that, that it's almost 80% um, conversion to spay neuter. Um, and, and people are keeping their pets. We have an over 95% retention rate. We do make follow-up phone calls for the next few months to make sure that animal's doing well, that they don't need help with anything. And, and verify if the animal is still in the home. And we've seen 95% of these animals uh, still in their home. So what's the cost of this? Um, it's less than you think. It's actually less expensive than rehoming animal through adoption or through um, the transport program. So it's less expensive for us to um, go out and do all of these free services with our team um, than to rehome an animal. So I think that's pretty exciting. You can go to the next slide, please. So again, this takes us back to that initial slide. And now that I've talked about all these programs, hopefully that's a little more clear on how all of these things fit together. Um, you know, we no animal walks itself into the shelter. There's always a person behind that animal and we're not going to uh, reach our goals without also uh, providing resources and support for the people on the other side of animals. And this is about companion animals. I mean, they enrich our lives we have to take care of that component as well. So I am going to turn you now over to Pearl Youssef, who's going to talk about some financials. Welcome, Pearl. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Uh, so from the warm and fuzzies to, to the, you get to the, the boring money parts with me. Um, my name is Pearl Youssef. I've been here since September of last year. When I first heard about the opportunity at St. Croix Animal Welfare Center, I was intrigued. And strangely enough, not because it's in a beautiful location. I've been in animal care and welfare for about 40 years now. Most of that time has been spent in American zoos and I've been entrusted with the care of many exotic and domestic species from elephants and koalas to ostrich and giraffes uh, there's few categories of animals that have not become a part of my life. Being a zookeeper and animal man manager for as long as I have been um, gave me time to realize that animal welfare doesn't stop at the gates of the zoo. I've been able to be involved in conservation initiatives and wildlife reintroduction projects around the world. I've done oversight panels on lab animal welfare. I'm still part of a team that worked down in Mexico to do spay and neuter clinics, clinics of underserved communities in Oaxaca. But the common thread through all my career has been advocating and ensuring the humane care and welfare of animals. In early conversations with Dr. Mahalik and with Laura, uh, I wanted to know what it was gonna be down here. And from the, our conversations, I thought it would be a great place for me to put my experience and skills to, the, to work. The shelter itself is that beautiful location that I've always wanted to be in. And I'm so happy to be in a position to make a difference on the island and with our animals. So as your executive director, I wanna give you the state of the union more or less. Uh, 2020 was a challenging year and I just wanna show you how how it looks. Next slide. For those of you not familiar with these kinds of numbers, restricted com uh, contributions are given for a specific item. If you want to see your support specifically go to one program or 
a piece of equipment, uh, that's, uh, that's what it gets restricted to take care of us. It's restricted to that cause. Unrestricted funds are available for daily operations as a whole. Compared to 2019, our income took a hit in a few areas and some categories due to the pandemic. The flea market and the pet place, our adoption center, had to limit hours and, and customers to who could come in. Unrelated to the pandemic were grant funds that we normally would re receive from the Department of Agriculture. We've been trying to work with them, but as of today, those funds have not been forthcoming due to, frankly, a lot of bureaucratic issues. I spent a considerable amount of my time devoted to trying to untangle red tape. You'll also notice that nearly a 90% drop in event income, but you have to think about there's no cruise ships, there's no shopping centers that we can go stand in front of, there's no pledge parties, there's no golf tournaments. Without events or a dedicated fundraiser on staff in place, our public face and our whole brand is limited. One mitigating factor is that some of our expenses were down because the doors weren't open some of the time or we weren't going out, you know, putting money into these events. So that part went down. But there are other things like all of you know that don't stop going up. Rents always rise and WAPA bills always need to be paid and sometimes go up. Uh, another mit mitigating factor, and it's not on this slide, is that we applied for and we were awarded a paycheck protection loan. We expect and hope that that loan is going to be forgiven, but right now it still exists as a temporary liability on our books. Things felt a bit grim at times, but like in other tough situations, we rose to the challenge. After re-baselining our budget and with the help of a successful Giving Tuesday campaign, and support from people like you. We made it through, but we can't stop now. We need to push forward. One thing we can do to get through that is, is start pushing our membership again. Tonight, I urge you to re retroactively join as a member. And let me tell you how that's gonna work. Next slide. We want to safely engage with you again. So we're revamping our membership and donor communications program. If you've made a donation of at least $50 in the last 12 months, please text member to 76278 or write Ellen Spooner at development at St. Croix AWC.org to join our roster of members. We want to acknowledge your support in turn and you will be alerted to our upcoming events when we get them going again, and we hope that we will, including some members only surprises like limited time discount from our business partner. As a member, you'll be alerted to events as they move off the drawing board and onto our calendar. What a difference it would make if everyone who donated in the past year would consider renewing their gift this year to support our programs and our vision for the future. If you haven't been a member before, go to our website and visit our membership page and choose the membership level that's most comfortable for you. And I hope Alan and I get to see you at live events in the near future. So you've heard Dr. Mahalik talk about Project SAFE. In terms of community relations, it's the jewel in the crown for promoting the animal to human connection. And it's our most intimate connection with the St. Croix community. When the ASPCA grant funding ends this summer, we want to fill the gap to maintain this connection to the community through till the end of the year, at least uh, with your help, it can become as vibrant as all of the other programs you heard Dr. Mahal talk about tonight. Financially, we have determined that it would take about $60,000 to sustain this program throughout 2021. It's an ambitious goal, but it's an important one. This is our challenge 
and we would like your support. If you've registered for this meeting on your phone, simply give, simply text give, G-I-V-E, give $25 to 76278 or G-I-V-E, followed by any amount to pledge for your, to pledge your support. If you didn't register by phone, text meeting to 76278. You'll be, you'll see a, a number of prompts that come up. Just follow those prompts. And then you can get to the part where it says give. And we'd like, we hope that you'd be able to do that. We'll repeat this slide at the end of the show. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to David Berg. He's the program coordinator for Project Safe, and he's been with the program since its start. He's not only the coordinator, but David grew up in the neighborhoods he now serves. There are people in those areas that remember him from when he was a kid. And now he's one of the faces that neighbors look for coming down the road, coming to help them take care of the animals they love. We've asked David to share some of his stories from Project Safe with you tonight. David? Yep. Hi, Pearl. Thank you so much for that. Hello, everyone. I'm David Berg. I'm the coordinator for Project Safe. I've had the honor to be the coordinator for the past two years. And I just wanted to share with you guys a little more personal stories, not just the numbers of what's been going on with Project Safe. So we could bring up the first slide for this photograph. So this is Alice. She's one of the many senior citizens within our program. She came to the actual low cost clinic here at the shelter, reaching out for help, but she was not able to physically put her dog into her car. So this is just an example of many clients like this in terms of us going to their house and treating them. But she actually became a client that led to her having a dog in a neighborhood that was a stray that everyone was kind of finding as a hassle and stuff, but she felt it could be something, a very good dog. And with our help in going to her house, we also made that stray dog, a community dog in a neighborhood. And in that photograph, you can see Alice with her original pet there and then the, the community dog into the background. All right, next slide, please. Okay, this is a very exciting project, part of the project too. This is Arlene Fredericks. She lives in William Delights, one of our targeted neighborhoods. Arlene was one of the people I've met doing the door-to-door -door services. And when I say door-to-door -door services, we are actually physically walking through the neighborhoods, hanging flyers, knocking on doors and sharing the program, communicating with individuals, letting them know what they have access to, the free care and the, on the ability of stuff that we could give to them. Arlene, we spayed all her animals for her. She had over six dogs, but she also took it upon herself to let the neighborhood know what was going on with this program. She literally started walking with us, knocking on doors. I would give her flyers. She would hang them out. And because of Arlene, we were able to spay whole streets of William Delights and not just like many, many areas. So the program has grown because of individuals in the neighborhood. So I almost feel like given access to these people, we've been able to empower them, which then empowers them to be better pet owners. Okay. Um, we were able to create Project Safe or started going before the pandemic, which was actually a, a miracle for us to happen because it has led to us being able to do other things community. And without question, I think it was when I was doing this program, I thought the COVID would be something that was going to just completely destroy the program, but as actually, if anything, has made it a perfect example of why we need it. And I think. We're going to finish this off now for our new president of the board of Jennifer Simpson. She's going to share more about that detail. Thank you, David. One second. So why aren't we home? We want to go home. We want to return to our much larger Clifton Hill property that was destroyed by Hurricane Maria. Most of you know that um, we are stuck. We are stuck in a world of bureaucracy. FEMA approved $1.4 million to rebuild at our Clifton Hill site, and they put it in the hands of ITEMA to manage distribution. To date, we have not seen a penny. Separately, we were denied building permits due to zoning issues, though we've been at that property for 45 years. So we're working through some of that red tape. We're really grateful for the significant donations that we have received towards our planned rebuild expansion. Those donations are safe and secure, earning interest for the project until we can kick it off. We can't use them right now at all until Vitima releases the funds and the permit issues are, res are resolved. If we start construction before those issues are handled, 
we could lose all of the $1.4 million uh, for FEMA because of the red tape that's required. So just know that we're continuing to work with VITEMA and DPNR to cross T's, dot I's, and every week there's a new processor asked, but we're going through it. Pearl is on it every day. We are considering all possibilities to resolve this issue, and we will continue to keep the public and our generous donors notified of any and all changes. But for now, that wraps up our presentation. Hopefully we'll be home soon. Uh, next slide. Alan? Yep, sorry, there it goes. It was delayed on my end, sorry guys. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight and for your ongoing support of the St. Croix Animal Welfare Center. Should you have any questions whatsoever, please contact Alan at development at St. Croix AWC. And we look forward to seeing you again live someday. Thanks again and good night. <laughs>